today, I hope that you will learn more about constipation and how to uh, identify and manage this specifically with children with autism spectrum disorder, give you some ideas for screening, screening questions that you might ask, and then talk really specifically about what behavioral management might look like. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that autism spectrum is a spectrum. And so you have children who um, may be very high functioning and children who may be very low functioning and that um, these tools aren't necessarily going to apply to every child on the spectrum, but give you some ideas of ways that you might be able to adapt it. So just briefly, the definition of constipation is hard, painful stools. Children have to have fewer than three stools a week. Uh, typically, I ask if children are stooling at least every three days. Um, sometimes kids have impaction. And so what that means is that you have a hard, painful stool that's sort of sitting um, on the rectum and it won't pass. And then what can be common is increases or leakage. And so a uh, liquid stool that leaks around that impaction. Um, and then I just wanted to put the definition of adherence on here because a lot of what comes up in constipation management is, is adherence and um, families struggling with following both the medical and behavioral recommendations. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about the fact that we're asking families to change their behavior and that they need to understand and agree upon that. Um, so just some things that are specific to children with autism when we're talking about constipation. Um, it tends to be more prevalent. So uh, statistics range from any, anywhere from a third to a half of children with autism will also struggle with constipation. Also, it tends to lead to higher um, utilization of the emergency department and then also subsequent inpatient stays that lead to clean outs in comparison to children without autism who have constipation. So it tends to just be a little bit more taxing on our healthcare system. Um, also, the behaviors that you see might look a little bit different in a child with, um, with autism where you have self-injurious behavior, sleep problems, parasomnias, which you aren't necessarily going to see in a child without um, autism. And then unfortunately, even if we have the perfect combination of treatment, uh, what research shows is that children with more severe autism just tend to sell treatment more often. And so I'm not putting that in there in order to um, ruin hope that treatment can't be successful, but just to remind you that you can do all of the things correctly and still this is just a, can be a difficult population. Um, so there are lots of factors that can lead to constipation and there are some for all children and then things just to consider when you're looking um, specifically with a child with ASD. So all children can, um, constipation can be caused by changes in routine, travel, weather, stress. Going to school is a huge one. Um, a lot of kids that I work with do not want to poop outside of their home. And so any change in routine that leads to having to poop outside of their home. Um, and then kids with autism, uh, what can make that even worse is difficulty with transition and then having some really rigid behavior about where they need to poop, when they poop, and that not always being accommodated when you have a change in routine. Um, toilet training. Difficulty toilet training, like in this last case, um, a kid who isn't toilet trained or parents that are struggling with toilet training can lead to constipation. Um, kids who are moving from a pull-up to potty, a lot of kids struggle giving up that pull-up and that, this, it sounds gross, but just that warm feeling of having poop in the pull-up can be uncomfortable to then move to a cold toilet. Um, and then again, if you have a kid who struggles with transitions and, uh, uh, some rigidity, then toilet training and letting go of a, getting rid of a pole can be more difficult. Low muscle tone can contribute to uh, constipation in kids with autism. Um, withholding behaviors. So what happens in withholding, and I, again, I see this a lot, is a child uh, gets constipated for with whatever reason and then has a painful poop and then uh, holds their poop because it hurts. And so they don't want to, they don't want it to hurt. And so they uh, engage, they try to keep their poop in. And we just see increased withholding behavior in children with autism. Um, 
in all children, not getting enough water, enough fluid, enough fiber. And then when you add autism into the mix, having children who are really selective eaters or have food sensitivities um, that make it more difficult to get fiber. And then there is some research that there's some altered gut microbes in children with autism. And so that can increase the, the risk of developing constipation. Um, and then again, illness medication and anxiety can, can contribute to constipation. And what I see is kids who, they don't like the sound of the toilet flushing. Um, they don't wanna poop on a different potty. Um, they just, kids with autism are, have, are more likely to develop anxiety. And so uh, constipation, painful poops can really kind of exacerbate that anxiety and make constipation more likely. Um, so some things to look out for, and these are things that I'm a psychologist, so I am not a physician. Parents often are not necessarily coming to me to talk about constipation immediately, but these are sometimes uh, things that get brought up that even I look for. So one of the, the biggest signs of constipation that I think is really important to keep in mind is leakage. And this is bolded because parents will miss this symptom. They will say to you, well, no, my kid is pooping fine. My kid, uh, my kid has has a uh, liquid stool, and or my kid is pooping. It like has accidents in their underwear, but they just can't poop in the toilet. They're just not getting on the toilet. And often, what that can be is a sign of leakage, and where you have that uh, painful, hard impaction, and the the liquid stool is leaking around. And so parents might miss this. And I always, I like to always ask about, um, you know, are you seeing stool in the underwear? Are they having poops? poop accidents, uh, just to get an indication of if there's any leakage. Poor appetite is another um, symptom. I think that one, all of us could understand that. If you're constipated, you don't feel well, you're not going to want to eat. Irritability and aggression, um, as previously mentioned, any sleep problems, parasomnias, um, kids complaining of abdominal pain or discomfort, and then kids who are nonverbal holding their stomach, hold, like bent over that they look like they're in pain, um, any posturing that can indicate that their stool is holding. So I think most of us who either worked with kids or have our own kids have seen a kid who's trying to hold their legs together, uh, tiptoeing, keeping their art back or their their art their back arched, um, trying to hold that poop in. Um, and again, a kid who's engaging in withholding is more likely to display this behavior because they're trying to, they don't want that painful poop to come out. Um, and then also specific to kids with autism, you might see exaggerated vocals, uh, stereopathies or repetitive behavior. So you might have an increase some exaggerated behavior that you wouldn't necessarily uh, above and beyond what you normally see. Um, so a couple things that I think some questions to think about when um, you're asking in a primary care visit or if there's any like suspected issues with constipation. Um, first and foremost, does your child sit on the potty? Does your child have a potty routine? Again, if you're talking to an adolescent, you know, you don't have to call it a potty, but does your child have a regular bathroom routine? Um, is your child using the bathroom independently? And this question, is important both for you to understand, is this child potty trained? But also, does the parent know how often they're pooping? Because once a child becomes um, independent in the bathroom, they might have no idea if their child is pooping regularly. Um, what are they wearing? Are they wearing underwear, pull-up, diapers? That gives you an indication also about toilet training and um, you know, further potential further complications about behavioral management if we're trying to get rid of pull-ups. How often does your child poop? Again, if they're independent in the bathroom, parents might not know, and you might have to ask a child. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say most of the children that I work with cannot always tell me how often they poop and it's not always reliable. Um, and so sometimes it's worth asking parents to then go back and monitor their child's pooping. Um, what does the poop look like? And there are lovely uh, Bristol stool charts online. I'll pull some of those up, but you know, pulling out a Bristol stool chart and having uh, both parents and child rate their stool on the, the chart. Um, are they having any trouble with, with the toilet becoming clogged? Uh, large stool is an indication of constipation. So if, if kids are constantly saying, hey, mom, I can't get the toilet flushed, that could be a sign for parents that 
um, that there's constipation. Are there any accidents, indication of leakage? Um, does your child look uncomfortable, either like engaging in that posturing or when they go to the bathroom, are they complaining of pain? Are they crying? Is there indi any indication that there could be any pain pre or during the bathroom to get an idea of if they're having those large painful poops? Again, is your, does your child look like they're trying to, to not go to the bathroom? Um, are you having to remind your child, you catch your child and it looks like your child needs to use the bathroom and remind them to, to get on the toilet. Um, and then, you know, a history of frequent UTIs, are they having any nighttime wetting? Um, you know, are they using the are they are they using the bathroom frequently? So they're peeing frequently, but not pooping frequently. Just because if you think about anatomy, if they are, you know, you have your bladder, and then if you have a large stool, it can push against the bladder and um, increase urinary frequency, increase the the risk of UTIs, and increase nighttime wetting. Um, any changes to behavior, mood. Um, how active they are, are they complaining of pain, and then changes to sleep patterns. So all really helpful questions for you to get an idea, um, both of is there constipation happening and what kind of intervention is this family going to need? Um, so here's some examples of the Bristol stool charts. I like the pretty one that um, kind of disgustingly explains poop as food. So I always acknowledge that this is kind of a disgusting way to, de to describe your poop, but um, also really helpful. So. I have this Bristol stool chart, I have it laminated, and I bring it up for most of the visits that I have, especially if we're discussing um, stomach pain or constipation. And it is fascinating how often, um, how often a parent either can't tell you where their poop is or kids and parents will disagree. But really what you're aiming for is that type four, that um, sort of some of the GI providers I work with like to describe it as soft serve ice cream. Again, it's really gross when we think about it that way, but really helpful to understand what kind of consistency you're looking for. Um, sometimes when kids have leakage, they might describe a size, uh, parents or kids might um, rate it as a type seven. So again, it's important to, to remember that leakage can kind of make this picture look a little bit different. Um, but what what is the poop looking like and how frequently does it look that way? Um, and then also helping families and kids know that you're aiming for a type four. And so it gives them um, it gives them an idea of, of what successful treatment will look like. Um, so there's this beautiful constipation algor algorithm that was created um, and then adapted for specifically for children with autism. And it was created to be used uh, by primary care physicians. Um, and in general, it was found to be pretty effective, again, except in those kids that were really, really severely um, had severe autism. So initial, upon that initial eval, and I'm just going to review this, there's the article has a really lovely um, graphic, but it, it did not look lovely when I put it on a PowerPoint. So if you have suspected or even confirmed constipation, you know, you make sure to do your red flag identification and perform that workup. Um, and this is this is done before it is typically before it's sent to me, but I still ask about red flags. Um, so, you know, I still I still make sure that I have a, a decent understanding of what's been done prior and keep my ears out in case something else comes up that doesn't fit with a, con a typical functional constipation presentation. Um, so, um, and then if, if it's determined to be functional constipation, then starting medication, um, which can be both oral rectal medication. And one of the pieces that they adapted for specifically for working with kids and families with autism is really exploring with families and patients um, what kids are likely to take. So do they have any uh, texture sensitivities? Do they have any sort of taste diversions? Um, I will tell you, most of the kids that I work with tell me that Miralax tastes gross. And every provider that I work with tells me that Miralax doesn't have a taste. And so if, if you're coming across that, there's other options other than Miralax that kids might be open to. Um, I also had a kid who unintentionally ate a whole box of uh, chocolate dokalax 
and will never for the rest of her life eat chocolate again. And so if you're coming in and you, and you don't know that about a child asking, you know, is there anything, uh, what, here are the medication options and is there any potential barriers to taking these medications? Um, in general, rectal medication is just, it's recommended for children with more severe autism. It's easier. Um, it's a way to get medication done consistently, but I think it's still important to talk to families about what options are available and if they're comfortable with that. Um, and then also I would encourage you to consider a consultation for behavioral intervention. Um, and I know we live in Idaho, resources are poor, but um, constipation management is really behavioral. And I think there's some things that can be done um, in primary care and in other offices that you don't necessarily have to have the, the um, GI psychology expertise. So it's recommended that uh, follow-up happens, determine if treatment is working, adjust medication, consult with the GI. Um, and then I encourage you to always consider that if medication is not working, that it might be an issue with medical adherence or the behavioral management. Um, so I have lots of families who come to me and they're like, we did Miralax, it didn't work. Miralax is recommended or medication in general, it's recommended to, to stay on board for at least six months. So you should see that symptoms improve before medication is stopped and families rarely do that. Um, and how I explain it to families is, you have a colon, your colon, your child's colon has been stretched out because they've been impacted for a long time and had large uh, poop that has stretched that colon out. And it takes time, it's a muscle, it takes time for that to shrink back down. And so if families give up on meditation quickly, they're likely to have a reoccurrence of constipation. Um, and so just, you know, following up about, are they still taking medication? Are they taking it regularly? Um, are they getting their child on the potty? How is that How is that working? And are those the things that need to be adjusted? Not necessarily treatment's not working. Um, continue to assess, adjust medication, engage families in problem solving. And then after that's been done, then refer to a GI or another specialist if, if it's still not working is the, the algorithm that has been developed. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the, the part that I enjoy, um, the behavioral management of constipation. So in general, when you have a child who's constipated, whether they have autism or not, what I recommend is starting with medication and then engaging in scheduled fits. So scheduled fits should happen 15 minutes after each meal and kids really only need to sit for about three to five minutes. Um, you can use a visual timer and I forgot to bring mine in, but um, there's lots of different timers out there on the market. You can use a cell phone and really all you do is you find a timer where uh, the kids can see they're colored, you pull it for three to five minutes and then they can see that time go down. Um, and then reward a child after every single sit. So we are not rewarding kids for pooping. We are rewarding kids for sitting. What we are trying to do is help kids get back in the habit of sitting on the toilet, help kids train their bodies to sit on the toilet and eventually stooling will happen. If a kid happens to poop on the toilet, yay. A, a parade should happen, they can get an extra reward, but the goal really is sitting, not pooping. Um, so <laughs> how do you make rewards work? I have families come in all the time who say, rewards don't work for my child. Uh, behavior charts don't work for my child, I've tried it. And really often they're, 100% right, they've tried it and they just, it needs to be tweaked a little bit and there's some things that they're not doing that can make it really successful. So the first thing that needs to happen is uh, that a reward needs to be motivating. Um, so you, so what is motivating for me is not necessarily motivating for my child. What's motivating for a parent isn't necessarily motivating uh, for their child. And so they need to figure out what is going to motivate their child. Um, even just sitting in the bathroom and giving a child attention can be really motivating. I often tell parents that your attention and your time is the number one motivating thing that you can give your child. You don't have to go out and buy them a bunch of toys. You just need to spend time with them and make it special and exciting. Um, the reward also needs to be immediate. And so I often work with families about an immediate reward with this. And then depending on the age of the child, they can get bigger rewards for, you know, if they earn a sticker after every sit, then they can get a bigger word. But 
really the reward right after the sit, they need to be rewarded for that. And depending on the age and the cognitive level of the child, sometimes you can delay the reward more. But really, I encourage families to, you know, it can be like blowing bubbles on the toilet. It can be uh, reading a book on the toilet. It can be uh, doing a silly dance with mom or dad after they've sat on the toilet. Um, it can be a sticker. It doesn't have to be a huge giant reward, but it needs to happen immediately. And then if they want to work larger towards larger rewards, they can do that. Um, but it also needs to be novel. So what I like to tell families also is if my boss, if I showed up to, to work on time, every single day um, and my boss said, Kelsey, I will give you a cupcake every day you show up on time. For two weeks, I would show up, I would show up early because I like cupcakes that much. After two weeks, I would be grossed out on cupcakes. I would be done. I probably still would show up on time because that's me. But for children, if you, you can't give them the same reward every single time and what motivates them one week isn't necessarily going to be motivating for them the next week. And so I encourage families to figure out, do they need to, to switch up the rewards? And that's often where I see, it's often where I see families uh, give up on reward systems is it's not immediate. So kids, they lose interest and it's not novel. Um, and so kids are like, well, I don't, I don't you know, I, I was into Legos six months ago and I don't really want that anymore, um, that they want something different. And so Again, depending on the age of the kid, I encourage families to talk to kids about that or to um, just automatically switch up the rewards and be able to be flexible about how they reward their child. Um, here's a sticker chart that I give to families. So again, giving an immediate reward, which might be a sticker or a small prize or a, you know, a silly dance, a hug, and then um, providing larger rewards once they fill this, the chart up. Um, and then making it achievable that, you know, if you have, if you're like, you need to sit for a month, a kid who's four isn't, that's not going to, that's going to be too far in advance or too long out for them to still be motivated by that. And so, you know, maybe it's at the end of every day or it's at the end of the week versus if you have a, a older child who were working on constipation, they might be able to go a month without a big reward. Um, so just adjusting it for the age of the child and the cognitive level of the child. So when we're talking about behavioral management, there's some um, special considerations that I think are important to think about when we're, you're working with a child with autism. Um, and I, I mean, even a child without autism, a lot of kids do not like loud flushing. Um, so there, and then there's other sensory experiences that might be distressing. Um, a cold toilet is can be really distressing for kids. Um, the uh, fear of painful poops. So um, kids, you know, once they have that that one incident of constipation where the they had a painful poop, then they engage in withholding and the poop hurts more, um, and then they just become fearful. So what can be really helpful for that is medication first and foremost, and then desensitization. And so that's just slowly working them back onto the toilet and slowly working um, and increasing, you know, giving them something that's really motivating to sit on the toilet. And then as they start to poop, increasing those rewards as well. But um, with a child with autism, just that anxiety and fear could potentially look more intense. Um, and then the difficulty with changes in routine. So one thing that I thought I thought was really interesting and I hadn't considered before preparing for this uh, presentation is um, that moving a child from a, a toilet training potty uh, and then moving them onto a regular potty can be really, really difficult because if you have a child who likes things to be the same, um, they might not want to move from a, a, a toilet training potty to a regular potty. And so um, one recommendation was just to, just to put them on the regular potty, toilet train there. Um, and then you can also do that with the school where you, you can work with the school to have, pick one pot, like one bathroom and the child just uses that bathroom um, if the school is willing to do that. And then also just poor communication. And so um, there can be some visual, there's some visual aids that are in this presentation and then um, getting them on the pot on a regular routine and helping them 
you know, uh, shape and develop the behavior. And it doesn't even have to be through communication, just doing it regularly can help get them in that routine. Um, so some other ideas to address the sensory sensitivities. One way that you can address the, the flushing is just have a kid wear headphones. Um, you can also have them listen to different sounds of the toilet flushing. Um, kids are super motivated by screens and it's a blessing and a curse, but you can have them sit on the toilet and then listen to the toilet, different uh, sounds of toilet flushing. And that can be rewarding because they they have access to a phone. Um, you can also work out a deal where, okay, you sit on the toilet and wash your hands and then I'll flush the toilet after you're out of the room. So slowly helping, you know, if that's the biggest issue, if, they're, if it's the noise sensitivity, figuring out ways to make it less uh, difficult. Um, and then I have to make a, some kind of uh, discuss the pull-ups. So um, a lot of parents, what I see is that they move from pull-ups to potty training. Kids don't like being out of the pull-ups and so they start withholding. And parents are like, I'm trapped. I can't get rid of the pull-up because they'll withhold, um, but now they're just pooping in the pull-up and I don't know what to do. So what I recommend is slowly removing the pull-up. So you start by having a kid poop in the pull-up on the toilet then you cut a hole in the pull up, uh, the pull up, and then you eventually get rid of the pull up. The rule is, once the pull ups are gone, once they are no longer wearing pull ups, they can't come back. So they have to be thrown out of the house. They have to leave the house completely. Um, and parents really can really struggle with that because they get anxious that uh, their kid's going to be constipated forever. But with medication and uh, behavioral training towards being on the toilet, it tends to work pretty well. Um, here's some examples of some visual aids that can be helpful for teaching a child. I think teaching a child both if you're working on potty training, but then also working on those scheduled sits with uh, the constipation management. So if you have a child with poor communication, parents can use visual schedules in order to um, you know, help teach their kid how to sit on the toilet. Um, and a lot of these visual schedules, they have different pictures that parents can adjust to and make their own or healthcare providers can as well. Um, so just briefly about, uh, to say a couple of things about uh, hydration, diet and activity. So the goal for children is really 24 ounces. Parents always say, well, my kid doesn't like water. Water is really best. Um, so sometimes, you know, they make, they used to make those little neo squirts, they probably still do, but there's things that can be put in water to make it um, more, to make it like kids more likely to drink it. Um, I also think, let them pick what, if, if it's, they're taking Miralax, let them pick what they mix it in. So if, it, if they don't normally get access to juice and a kid really wants to, um, wants juice, that's one way to get them to take their Miralax, Gatorade, um, just trying to be creative and fun about how both both to get water in in the Miralax. Um, so diet, you know, and high fiber diet is ideal for working when a child has constipation and avoiding white foods. Unfortunately, children with autism, they just often have restricted diets and have, um, I've worked with children who that's really all they wanna eat is uh, white foods. So if you have a family who's struggling with that and they already are connected to a feeding therapist, you can talk to them about increasing uh, high fiber foods in that, or you can talk to families about getting connected to a feeding therapist. If it's really, really difficult and uh, that's where you feel like you're not moving forward with constipation management. Um, and then increased movement also is helpful for constipation. Um, and the cool thing, I think, you know, this is specific to Boise, and I didn't look across the uh, across Idaho, but Parks and Recreation offers a lot of adaptive recreation options, and so it's a nice way to get families out, to get kids out, and incre uh, increase movement, and then there's a lot of other, or I was going to put other organizations, and then I was, I was surprised by how many organizations there are out there that offer adaptive sports, and so it's just another option for families to get kids out, get kids moving, um, get them doing something different. And it also takes a little bit of the onus off of parents where they might have some, um, you know, a coach or a teacher who's 
providing those options. And so parents don't, might not, it might be a way that parents can step back and let their kids get um, increased movement where they're, instead of having to manage this all on their own. Um, so I think to sum up, it's really important to develop that care plan. Um, we talked about medication, making sure that families really understand that they, they need to, their children needs to be on medication for at least six months. Um, behavioral management, it's something that, uh, you know, you can refer to a, a therapist, um, somebody with some experience. And I also think it's very doable in a primary care office with some brief intervention around providing education around scheduled fits and how to, to um, um, you know, reward your child for engaging in the behavior that you want to see. And then making, you know, monitoring that dietary and ex exercise changes. Um, and then I think it's just the monitoring part is making sure that you're really looking at adherence, um, really giving families a lot of praise and encouragement for making changes in their life to improve their child's uh, dueling. Because this is, it, it sounds easy, but it can be really hard. Um, you know, sometimes talking to families about like, like, when are you giving medication? Is there a way to make it uh, easier to remember to take medication. Um, you know, I know sometimes for families, they'll put the medication out or they'll put it in front of the milk that they give their child every day, or they uh, leave it on the counter in the bathroom, um, that there's ways that you can make it easier and suggestions that you can provide to make it easier for families to remember to take medication. And then, um, you know, just giving them a lot of praise and encouragement when they do make these behavioral changes. Um, so I we have time for questions. We do. I think Tom is going to facilitate. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Sorry for joining late. We had a population explosion in Nampa and, uh, and no one was straightforward. So um, in any case, thank you so much for that incredible lecture. It's a tough subject. And uh, I'd love to hear what any of our participants have to um, ask Dr. Newton. I know you all have good questions. Okay. I know in the chat, Dr. Aldous had asked about things to help out with pain of passing stool other than softening the stool. And I had added about mineral oil, um, doesn't get absorbed by the body. So it acts as an internal lubricant and that can be helpful too. And mineral oil doesn't, again, have a lot of taste. And if you blend it up well, with a one mixer, it will go into solution. And if it's drink pretty quickly, it won't separate. Kelsey, you're welcome to stop sharing as well. Okay, thank you. What are the questions y'all have? I'm on my phone, so I can't see everybody. If you have a hand raised or if you wanna come off mute and ask your question, that'd be great. The other thing that I might say about pain is distraction works wonders. Um, so another job that I do is uh, as a pain psychologist. And so um, <clears throat> working with rewarding a child and then distracting a child and making the toilet <clears throat> moderately fun can be helpful to take their mind off the pain when you're trying to get over that initial fear of a painful poop once you have medication on board. Dr. Newton, what would you, what would you, I like, how would you entertain? What are some of your recommendations on entertaining in the bathroom <laughs> and, and on and the kiddo on the toilet? Yeah. So again, it depends on the age. Bubbles are fantastic. You can play music. Um, you know, if you have an older child and depending on family culture, I think it's, it's okay to let them play a game for three to five minutes. Um, that's another way that you can make it rewarding. So they can play a game on your phone or their tablet um, read a book. Um, kids love when their parents do silly dances, depending on the age and, uh, their motivation, but they, you know, I think a lot of your parents are probably going to know how to, uh, be very distracting for three to five minutes or even just one minute once they get over that initial fear of sitting because of pain. Yeah, thank you. That's really great advice. And then um, Julia's added Elmo um, potty time videos, and I know you're all Googling that right now. But um, Dr. Francis, I saw you had your hand raised. 
Yeah, Kelsey, thanks so much. That was a great yeah. um, didactic. Um, I Yeah, make it fun. And so I love the bubble idea. Um, if you blow air through pursed lips, it uses kind of the same muscle that you would use to bear down. And oftentimes, you know, our kiddos with, with autism have low tone and have difficulty with coordination, right? So to coordinate all those muscle movements, you know, to push and get the poop out is really hard. So bubbles is a great activity. I sometimes tell parents to um, get like a pinwheel. You guys remember those like old pinwheels, just kind of blow and watch those spin or even just blowing air through like a straw can kind of mimic that um, kind of muscle movement. And that might help it make a little bit easier and less painful for kids um, to push the poop out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. What are the other um, questions y'all have? I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. <laughs> believe that silence is good and it will ultimately bring a question out. <laughs> Do you know how long you are booked out in terms of if we referred one of our kids to you? Yeah, so um, so I'm currently seeing kids for outpatient therapy in private practice um, and I have availability, but I only am credentialed with Blue Cross and I do private pay and then select host any day. Um, for St. Luke's, I'm, uh, my role is really limited right now. So I'm not seeing kids for uh, like outpatient follow-up. I'm just running a, a group. Um, Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. I just, I know <laughs> all of us are in a bind to find um, quality people to help us um, care for these kids. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I honestly don't know a lot of other people who do the like behavioral con management of constipation. Um, so it's definitely something that I maybe enjoy more than most uh, talking about. Just, I enjoy G like the GI psychology part. I see Mike has a question as well. If you are seeing kids with aversive eating disorders. Yeah, so I, uh, I have, um, I've seen a lot of kids with aversive eating disorder, or like the um, in GI, I haven't seen a lot in my private practice. And some it just depends on the sort of what's going on, because um, sometimes the sort of overlap between aversive eating, like the aversive eating and um, eating disorders can be gray and I don't typically work with uh, kids with eating disorders. I typically try to refer them to some of our providers in the Valley who have more, uh, who are specialists. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, I think we're just about at time. Um, that was an incredible discussion. Thank you for letting me come to the party late and I'll pass um, the baton back to Lindsay, but thank you so much. And Dr. Newton, that was incredible. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Kelsey. You're welcome anytime. Um, and Jill, thanks for your case today and the great conversation that followed that. So our next session will be August 24th. Um, please note the time is a little different for that one. Um, we've got 12.30 to 1.30 um, because we, for our stat cohort, we have a QI meeting following. So 12.30 to 1.30 Mountain Time on the 24th. The topic is what is ABA, Common Behavioral Strategies, presented by our panelist, Julie Whitman. So thanks so much, Julie, for prepping for that. And we hope to see you on August 24th. Thank you. Take care.